Hello and welcome back to the Compass Podcast. Today on the show, we have Joshua Lim, Head of Derivatives at Genesis Global. Joshua is an expert on all things market structure for Bitcoin and altcoins. We talk about the Fed's interest rate moves, how the stock market and Bitcoin mining markets are correlated, and what hedging instruments miners are using during this downturn. Josh, thank you so much for joining us on the Compass Podcast. Really excited for this conversation. It's a little bit different than I thought it was going to be at first, but that's okay. We're making a, a quick pivot to talk about some other things. Um, can you just start off the conversation, your background in Bitcoin, when you got involved with it? Uh, and then also, I want to start moving over into talk about what Genesis does with, uh, with the asset market. Yeah, absolutely. I'm, I'm really glad to, to be able to join you. Um, you know, I work at Genesis Trading, which is a, a, a large sell side dealing desk. Um, we facilitate a lot of um, liquidity, you know, spot trading, derivatives trading, as well as financing transactions for counterparties that are accessing crypto um, from either a traditional markets lens, you know, so basically some of the newer entrants to the space, you know, hedge funds, asset managers, um, corporate treasuries, uh, as well as the guys that have been in the space for a very long time and have, have been, you know, among, among the earliest customers of Genesis, which include the mining segment, um, a lot of high net worth individuals, you know, project uh, treasuries um, and, and the like. And crypto native hedge funds is, is, is another big category for us as well. So we, we kind of provide all the, you know, financial markets, infrastructure services, you know, um, specific products, uh, anything that's sort of like high touch and customized to uh, people in the space, we, we try to offer them. Yeah, totally. And it's we're, we're joining this conversation at an interesting time within the markets, right? So the, the Fed has turned uh, interest rates up over the last few weeks. Um, that was noted back in December with those leaked notes. And then I think we're at like 75 basis points. The market itself responded pretty interestingly to it, or I guess predictably more than anything. So, so we saw equity sell off uh, over like compared to like the last six weeks or so they've sold off. Bitcoin is down as well. It's whether it's some interesting parts, uh, some some interesting storms with like the Terra Luna thing. And so miners, which are basically our audience, are in a unique situation where Bitcoin is down. Their costs are up because a lot of people are still building right now. And then difficulty is also up. Um, we will, we'll get into like loan structure or other things like that later and derivatives and, and whatnot. I'm curious to get your lay of the landscape now from uh, from a, like a trading perspective and from an asset management perspective. What are things going to look like going into the summer and how are you reading the tea leaves right now? Yeah, it's a great question that comes up a lot, especially with more um, you know, technologists and crypto native people in the space that are maybe less uh, attuned to what's going on broader macro markets. Um, yeah, for, for us, like uh, what we've noticed over the last two years, two, three years, as more um, institutional market participants come into crypto is just how much crypto has become embedded in uh, the broader portfolio of macro tradable products. Right. So a lot of these hedge funds, you know, whether they're uh, macro trading firms that sort of allocate a little bit into crypto um, amongst kind of a broader portfolio of equities and fixed income products and FX and commodities, um, they are, you know, trading into and out of this asset class in the same way that they would, you know, equities. Right. So basically they view it as another risk instrument. Um, that's why if you look at correlations across, um, you know, Risk assets like equities, uh, like, you know, certain commodities, uh, measures of growth, um, they're pretty you know, closely tied to the price performance in Bitcoin, right? Bitcoin and ETH and a lot of the major crypto assets. So um, I think what we saw earlier this year, and this kind of stretches even back to kind of December when markets started to price in, you know, the Fed uh, raising interest rates, trying to curb inflation, um, trying to sort of like uh, dampen the um, the effects in the economy of you know obviously the, the huge liquidity bomb that kind of, they kind of dropped into things uh, post COVID um, was a de-risking just a broad de-risking we saw people I think start with riskier assets like crypto really start taking down that risk um, you know at the beginning of the year um, and 
if you think about what that means, that means, you know, there's going to be an underperformance in the large cap tokens, because those are the assets that are really being held by these macro uh, hedge funds, right? So um, those guys took down the, the crypto risk first, and then they started, you know, de-risking across equities. So you saw sort of like tech, you know, NASDAQ is a good proxy for the sector getting hit. Um, and then you saw sort of more recently things like retail stocks, um, you know, like Target and things like that, where, you know, the, the secondary effects of um, inflation, um, you know, reducing the profit margins is starting to, to, to come through, right? So that's what we're seeing in the markets is just sort of this gradual de-risking across different, um, different assets. And so crypto has been in a lot of ways de-risked already. And I think the cherry on top in the last month was basically this, this um, you know, the Terra Luna episode, um, which really caused this last leg of really de-risking across the space. We saw a lot of sort of um, really popular and crowded trades get taken off, um, including, you know, uh, ETH BTC uh, long short, right? Like the long ETH short BTC type of pair trade where people were kind of positioning ahead of the merge. Um, you know, at the end of last year, that looked, you know, broke 0.08. It looked really poised to kind of like keep going, you know, hit 0.1. Um, a lot of people were positioned for it. And, and then obviously, as that wave of de-risking started to happen, um, that has broken down and, and it, it, it hit, you know, 0.06 a couple times um, earlier uh, in the month. So that's kind of what we're seeing across the board, um, just a little bit of uh, taking off risk. I think now that equity has started to stabilize here, um, what that really means is, you know, we're going to see the same thing play out in reverse, right? So like people start to allocate back into investments that look on a valuation basis attractive. So, um, you know, value stocks, things like that, um, you know, by a lot of metrics, even technology stocks like Google look pretty attractive at this, at these levels. So as money starts to flow in there, then they'll start to flow back into Bitcoin, right? As the kind of like gateway into all of crypto. And then you'll see, um, I think ETH and other altcoins start to outperform from here. I like the way you laid that out, uh, just starting from the top and going all the way down to Bitcoin and, and large cap cryptos. Let's stay with the Fed thing for a second. I recently listened to Odd Lots podcast, Tracy Alloway, Joe Weisenthal, talking with Ed Harrison, who's a business editor over at Bloomberg, talking about like, what, what is the Fed doing? Like, what is their game plan at this point? And of course, a lot of this is reading into like Jerome Powell's tone, reading into like whatever the Fed is putting out in their notes and, and just trying to make a sense of the mess that is over at the Fed. And his position on it was that the Fed is trying to work in the most optionality into their, into their game plan right now. They're trying to raise rates quickly while they can in hopes that if something bad happens, they are able to, again, lower rates and then increase, uh, incre uh, maybe a better way of saying it is like lower rates so that you can help the market get along again when, uh, when there's a crunch. And that'd be like the worst case scenario, right? Uh, be curious to get your take on it. Where do you see the Fed turning from here? Are you expecting more interest rates uh, push or interest rates to continue pushing up? Are you expecting more quantitative tightening? Obviously, we saw a little bit of an announcement around that this morning. Yeah, yeah. Um, I'm not a fortune teller, but I guess if you look at market measures of um, inflation expectations, those have come in, right? So basically, you know, looking at like, you know, 10 year yields or, um, you know, for uh, kind of inflation break evens, those types of measures. Um, it looks like the market's pricing in that inflation has topped in a way. Um, and like, I, I don't, I'm not a, an economist and I, I don't claim to have any sort of special insight into this, but I would say like that is a little bit of a optimistic interpretation of where the world is, especially kind of in a broader, you know, secular view. Um, you know, there is a lot of sort of re resource competition uh, in the world today, right? Between sort of like US and China, um, there is still sort of this transition that the world is making to um, a greener sort of world. Um, and, you know, a lot of that transition away from um, fossil fuels has to involve sort of, um, you know, uh, inflation, you know, inflation or sort of like um, price increases in commodities um, like, like base metals and copper and things like that. So um, it is, in my view, like, or, you know, pretty optimistic to sort of like make a case that, you know, inflation's sort of been 
the slate and, you know, it's time for, uh, you know, the Fed to kind of like rein back their hawkish impulses and sort of let equities breathe again. Um, I don't know if that's going to happen or not. I mean, it, it could very well be sort of like the, the base case going forward. But um, from our, you know, from my personal point of view, um, it makes sense to sort of take a cautious stance on this um, and kind of wait to see how it plays out. Right. I mean, we're um, I as a trader, I'm as data dependent as kind of the Fed is. Okay. Okay. That makes sense. And I, I want to go back to something you said earlier about like how inflows affect uh, the larger market cap uh, crypto coins out there like Bitcoin or like Ethereum. Can you sort of lay that out? I think our audience would be, that'd be very helpful to talk from like top of the funnel to bottom of the funnel. Uh, like you said, a lot, a lot of these value investors are only willing to invest in uh, larger coins like Bitcoin if like their other assets are doing well. For sure. For sure. Yeah. So, um, you know, I, I think it's useful to kind of divide crypto into categories, right? So um, Bitcoin is in a lot of ways in its own class as a sort of store of value. It has this narrative around it that it is um, independent of any single sovereign, right? And so, and it's it's a, you know, censorship resistant way of storing and transferring money. And it's something that I think has to exist exist natively in uh, kind of a digital, you know, internet first world, right? So people need to have internet native um, source you know, stores of value, and I think that's why we're all uh, in this industry and and why we're probably listening to this podcast in particular. Um, so I think that narrative is a very powerful one in this current day and age, right? Because um, we are moving to a world where there's a lot of sort of, it's a fractured world, it's a multipolar world. And um, that narrative has become like, a, the thesis around Bitcoin has become more uh, dominant over time. And that's, you know, I think that plays into sort of the way that Bitcoin dominance um, could increase and has sort of increased over time here, especially as some of the errors come out of, um, you know, high inflation curve uh, tokens, tokens that have launched in the latest cycle over the last two years. Um, you know, I, I tend to think of them as sort of like small to mid cap names um, that have come out in the sort of like 20, uh, sort of 2018 to 2020 vintage, like that kind of bucket, right? So um, these are tokens that generally have had some venture investment into it, right? Some percentage of the token supply is closely held by like insiders and early investors. Uh, and, and, you know, as we as these tokens age, um, this is kind of like the middle of their uh, supply curve where uh, there tends to be more supply um, unlocking right over time. You know, generally a lot of these projects unlock, you know, on a schedule of, you know, one to four to seven years, you know, depending on kind of which layer one it's on and, and the types of uh, venture investors that are involved in it. So um, it's hard to overcome, especially in a range bound or bear market like we're in now, um, that amount of supply hitting the market, right? There's, you know, the, the true believers or the people who are kind of in it for the long haul already hold whatever amount allocation into uh, a particular project that they want to have. Uh, the marginal buyers are tapped out, right? So it really does take this sort of like new um, impulse, new sort of animal spirit, you know, bull market to start. And you have to see that start with the majors first, um, because those have a sort of like exogenous reason for existing. Like there is a reason for Bitcoin to exist. There is a reason for ETH to exist because, you know, this, this global kind of computation platform um, and the money will flow into those things first before it kind of disperses across to other projects that have utility building on top of the, those sort of like base layers. Um, so that's that's kind of how it usually works uh, in crypto. And, you know, we've all probably seen a couple of cycles of this play out. Yeah, totally. Thanks for laying that out. So let's move over more to Genesis and talking about your day to day function. And obviously there's there's some overlap with Bitcoin mining here as much as like the asset Bitcoin has an overlap in what you guys are able to touch with your desk. Uh, be curious to, to get some information about how you see uh, yourself positioning these trades that you guys are making and also positioning like any sort of financial primitives or financial products that you guys are creating for others. Uh, the, the impetus for this whole 
podcast was a recent Bloomberg article that you were quoted in from David Pan talking about how uh, some of these public miners have set up really nice hedges for themselves to protect themselves in case of a market downturn. Uh, and, and as we both know, and many listeners of the podcast know, Bitcoin miners had an interesting year last year, and now they're feeling a lot of pain going into this year. They've had basically only down, only vibes like 80% in some cases, or not quite 80%, but like I think 60, 70% in some cases, like been pretty brutal for some public miners out there. Um, so let's get into derivatives for public miners in a second. But if we could start out getting an understanding of how Genesis is looking at uh, the financial products, it's uh, creating for uh, the, for any participant, really. I, w- I won't uh, put you in a box. Yeah, yeah. I mean, Genesis, like every other company in the space, has really evolved over time to kind of meet the moment of you know what, what is needed in the market, right? So um, Genesis started really in like 2013 um, as, a, as the sort of like capital markets business within Digital Currency Group, which is like a large conglomerate run by Barry Silver which owns, you know, Genesis Grayscale, CoinDesk, a bunch of other, a bunch of other pieces. Um, and as part of that, you know, that was the initial kind of set of products was around spot trading, right? So it was sort of dealing with miners in the sense of, you know, helping them to liquidate um, assets that were mined, um, assets on their balance sheet. Um, you know, it, it was working with a lot of, um, let's say, high net worth individuals that wanted to allocate into crypto for the first time or, you um, corporate treasuries or, um, you know, even you know, exchanges that needed to liquidate, you know, fees that they were collecting in Bitcoin, uh, you know, denominated sort of uh, exchange fees, that those, those sorts of things. Um, and then over time, the set of products really evolved, right? So the next thing to be added and really to evolve as, um, as, a, as a separate category was lending, right? Lending and borrowing of crypto assets. And that really started with just Bitcoin and ETH. Um, because those were by far like the largest market caps and there was a lot of demand for people, um, especially coming into and out of the sort of ICO bubble, this is 2017, 2018, to um, manage risk, uh, hedge exposures to sort of even get short, right? Like, you, you know, I'm sure we all remember there was like a pretty vocal hedge fund out there um, coming out of the ICO bubble that was kind of pounding the table, like we want to get short ETH, right? It's like the funding currency for all these ICO um, fundraises and people need to liquidate it. And if it gets bad enough, it's going to go way down because everyone's going to sell at the same time. That was kind of the thesis. So, yeah, so that was, you know, that, that was um, one of the, you know, the, the sort of um, trading uh, narratives that required a, sort of like a business like Genesis and there's other lenders out there to provide supply in um, tokens for lending and borrowing. Um, and then the other major use case that came about over time was just there's such a big demand for um, market making and liquidity providers and sort of market neutral, you know, quant trading firms to borrow assets so that they can provide two sided markets on exchanges, right? Or to provide liquidity into DEXs, right? Um, into AMFs. So, um, you know, once we started to sort of like uh, explore all these use cases and develop all these bilateral trading relationships, um, it was sort of a great two way business, right? A lot of people want to generate yield with assets that they have. They would lend it to us. And then a lot of people would want to borrow them to sort of put them to productive use. Um, Now, the next step beyond that is really once you help people sort of finance their trading activities in crypto um, is to sort of introduce even more sort of capital efficiency capitally efficient ways to sort of uh, get access, trade crypto, hedge risk, all that kind of stuff. So the next layer is derivatives, right? So that's kind of when I joined Genesis two years ago is to help build out this business. And um, when people think about derivatives and crypto, it's usually, you know, perpetual swaps, right? Perpetual swaps, futures. There's a lot of listed products on exchanges like Binance and Huobi and Deribit, you know, OKX, um, FTX that sort of meet that um, general specification of a derivative, um, but not every uh, trading firm in the space has access, or or even like corporate or counterparty that we deal with has access to those venues. And some people are restricted from trading on certain venues, or maybe it's not in their mandate to be able to trade sort of like perpetual swaps, things like that. So, um, you know, there's sort of a need for a firm like Genesis to sort of intermediate some of those transactions. Um, be a good counterparty to people, um, help them sort of even structure things that are a little bit more bespoke to the particular types of needs that they have, right? So for miners, um, the ones that are actively engaged in hedging, you know, there might be sort of use cases around 
um, sell and call options, which is basically um, you're capping sort of the return of Bitcoin that you're holding on your balance sheet. Uh, but in return for capping that performance, meaning like you're willing to sell at a certain price above the current spot price, you get some premium, right? So you collect some amount of money up front um, in exchange for giving up the potential upside. Now, if you know, the asset doesn't trade up to that level, then you're not giving anything up. You're just collecting some premium. But because there's some probability of that, um, you know, giving up that upside, you, you get some, some payment up front. And similarly, you can buy that same sort of protection on the downside, right? You could buy a put option, which basically protects you from um, adverse moves in Bitcoin lower, right? So below a certain price point, you are no longer affected by the, the price of Bitcoin going lower and you have the right to basically sell Bitcoin at the, that, a particular strike price, the strike of that put option. So um, basically that's the most common structure, right? Either selling calls and, and, and keeping the premium or selling calls to use that premium to buy put options. Um, and then there's a lot of ways to put it together. There's just a lot of variations you can, you can build off that. Yeah, there's definitely a lot of variations we should get into a second. I want to go back to something you said a second ago, though, which is about how a lot of these other coins out there, proof of stake coins, you guys are able to package financial primitives together for them. And I'm curious to get your take. Do you find that there are more ways for uh, leveraging your position as a proof of stake network versus proof of work in terms of getting uh, more access to financial capital? Um, I there might be some sort of way to do that just because proof of stakes um, native way of uh, accruing value and securing the network is very different from proof of work, but I'd be curious to get your take. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, the, the, the main difference from a financial markets perspective is there's an additional variable, right? Which is what is the uh, yield that you would collect over time for holding an asset, a proof of stake asset. Um, and in a proof of work network, obviously you're rewarded with some um, tokens, but those tokens themselves don't have any inherent sort of protocol level yield embedded into it, right? So just holding that token or staking it doesn't generate additional um, benefits uh, on top of on top of what you've already earned. So the yield is is a variable yield, right? Um, it can change over time according to some um, you know, programmatic uh, formula, or it can sort of fluctuate depending on sort of market forces, um, the number of people participating, um, you know, your own ability to sort of like validate transactions and things like that. So what we found is um, there's an active market basically for uh, taking, you know, staking uh, tokens and sort of hedging the risk out either, there's two types of risk, right? When, you, when you're staking a, a token, into a, a proof of stake network, it's either the market price of that token. So you're taking exposure to whether those tokens uh, go up in value or down in value. Um, and then the second is sort of the, the yield itself on those tokens, assuming the price stays constant, um, can go up or down, right? Like I said, according to some formulaic sort of um, method or just by market you know, supply and demand. So um, the, uh, we can sort of help people hedge both out. In some sense so the first type of hedging would just be to um, neutralize your market exposure by uh same thing you would do for bitcoin you would you would you know you could sell calls you could buy puts you could sell a forward which is um, basically um a linear instrument that neutralizes so basically if if uh, you know let's say dot goes up in value um and you sold a forward you would lose money on the forward because you sold it but you would make money on the underlying asset going up in value. So you're neutralized from any sort of price movement. Um, the second type of hedging, which is like more of the yield hedging, is really a combination of two things. You're basically, um, you're basically buying spot, which sort of lets you get, get exposure to a floating rate, which is the floating rate is basically, it's a fluctuating rate based on um, you know, how much you're able to earn from staking. And you sell a forward, which when you sell a forward, you're basically locking in um, the, the price of that asset in the future. And inherently, you're locking in sort of the embedded amount of yield that you would collect over a certain time period. So um, when you do that sort of like people sometimes call it like interest rate um, curve trading. So basically, you're taking two points in the future and you're sort of. Um, buying one and selling the other, you're locking in some inherent sort of uh, implied yield in that time period. So that's a pretty, you know, it's becoming more common, especially as the, you know, the, the market cap of these staking assets increases. Um, and it has a lot over, over the years. 
and um, the variety of those assets increase. And, and also just the number of market participants that are engaged in staking, whether it's um, hedge funds that you know, are holding these assets on the balance sheet um, or you know, actual sort of operating companies that need to participate in these networks for various reasons. Um, or venture firms that have these tokens from from being early supporters, or or um, you know staking infrastructure companies that are running nodes for themselves or for um, their customers or for exchanges. You know, there's there's just a huge variety of um, users now, all of which have some exposure to um, the yield and the price of the underlying asset, and they're you know willing to transfer that risk at a certain price. So again, that's like one of these things where we can help intermediate and find you know the clearing price for. Uh, for that type of risk. Totally, totally. This reminds me of some conversations I've had with some mining pools that are also trying to get into financialization because it's just like all cash flows, right? Like there's, how do you like take these cash flows and create a financial product for whatever type of customer walks in the door? Maybe one customer wants very like low risk yield. Maybe someone's like a little bit more hyper aggressive and able to package things together. I don't know. Uh, F2 pool is a huge mining pool. I think they have like 25% of Bitcoin networks hash rate, somewhere around there. Um, they also have a staking pool. Um, things like stake fish or something like that. They've, it's like a funny name. Yeah. So they, uh, there's definitely like a lot of financialization within Bitcoin mining. So let's pivot back to that for a second. If we can want to just take a brief overlook. Uh, and I know this is more of a, a place of work that you operate in with multiple partners. So I'm not going to stick your feet too close to the fire here on this on this question, but I'm curious to get your take on what sort of financial derivatives some of these public miners are using to hedge their positions. Marathon, obviously very famous or within Bitcoin mining circles for the moves they made last year by converting some senior debt notes or something of another and able to, to create like a, a low interest way uh, to fund their operations till 2026. I'm not familiar enough with it to, to give a good summary of the uh, the whole story, but it is important just to, for our audience and for miners to know like what derivatives are out there and what derivatives have public miners been using to date to fund their operations. Yeah. Yeah. So, um, you know, one thing that is important to a lot of miners is, um, you know, one is reducing risk, right? So if you're mining, you inherently have some long exposure to Bitcoin, you want Bitcoin to go up. Um, so how do you reduce that exposure? Um, and one way is to sell derivatives that um, give you sort of that negative correlation, right? So, um, you know, one thing that's common, and I think um, you mentioned that that Bloomberg article that came out, um, is some, we see a lot of this, which is basically selling call options um, to generate yield. And um, the other thing that's important for a lot of miners is sort of ensuring that you have some sort of cash flow to fund operating costs. Um, so, you know, obviously in like a more um, easy money environment where it's easy to raise debt, you know, denominated in dollars or raise equity, um, you know, there wasn't really a lot of need to sell, you know, Bitcoin um, cash flows. Um, there wasn't really a need to sort of like hedge the risk in some sense, right? Um, but as conditions have reversed and you're sort of entering this market where it's a little bit tighter, um, you know, valuations have come in a lot. It's maybe less attractive to raise equity financing. Um, people are starting to think the other way, right? So how do I take my existing, say, pool of Bitcoins that I'm sitting on? Um, and then how do I sort of monetize that? And one way to monetize it is to sell the, you know, the call options basically give you two things. They give you the ability to sell those coins when they go up in value, because you're actually obligated to sell those coins because you've sold a call against them. So you, you get dollars back as Bitcoin rallies, which is the right way of risk that you want. Um, and then you also uh, get um, some yield, some dollar yield from just sort of systematically selling these call options. Even if Bitcoin doesn't go up in value, you would collect the premium. So from a cash flow perspective and from sort of a market risk hedging perspective, it makes sense. Awesome. Yeah. I'd be curious to know, I don't know if you can leak this alpha or if it, even if this is a good question to ask, but from your guys' book right now, do miners make up a significant portion of the clients you service or is there just like not enough volume there because there's only 900 Bitcoin mined per day and it's split up among so many participants? It's, it's um, a part of our book, but it's not um, the overwhelming amount of our, of our, you know, not an overwhelming percentage, I would say it's, um, 
it is a big driver. And especially for the firms that have um, a lot of assets on their balance sheet uh, already that have, that have accumulated over years, right? So it's not, not necessarily hedging like the 900 Bitcoin that are produced daily, but it's really hedging accumulated um, balance sheet that's already kind of assets on the balance sheet. Um, I would say we see basically uh, a fairly two-way amount of trading in these call options from miners that would be selling it, but also from you know other firm types of market participants that would be buyers of it. And if you think about who would be buyers, it's a lot of times it's um, you know speculators or sort of very tactical hedge funds that are trying to um, position ahead of let's say a short squeeze uh, that they see on the horizon, right? Or um, some sort of specific catalyst, like let's say they expect, um, you know, some macro data to come out that shows, you know, inflation's eased and, and we think the market will rally on the back of that. Um, that that would be sort of a, a good uh, reason to, to go long call options on a, on a very short data basis. Uh, and so there is, you know, there's a healthy sort of like exchange of risk and that kind of what is what sets, you know, market pricing for options in venues like Deribit, which is like one of the largest sort of options exchanges in the world. There's there's a lot of market participants that are sort of, you know, actively trading it daily. Awesome. Okay. That helps me make sense of the landscape. Final question for you, then you're off the hook from me for today. And again, appreciate your time. Han. Um, curious to get your take on where this market goes for miners. So the, the story of 2021 was miners hodling their Bitcoin, leaving it on their balance sheet, not really touching it. Some of them were loaning it out. So we had Jamie from Hut 8 on the podcast like a year ago now. So we need to get her back on. And at the time, she said that they were lending it out through Celsius, like the Bitcoin that they had on the balance sheet to get additional yield. Uh, then we also had Ben from uh, BitFarms on the show, and they said they're hodling. They're not, their Bitcoin stays in cold storage. They don't do anything with it. And we've seen a lot of different people take different strategies. In the last two months, we've seen people sell, right? Has sold about 500 Bitcoin. Cathedral Bitcoin sold like $8 million worth of Bitcoin uh, this last month. So, Obviously, market conditions have changed within one year a ton, but doesn't mean that we're not going to see market conditions continue to change. Some might sell, might, some might hodl, some might lend out their Bitcoin. Where do you think that market goes going to the rest of the year? Uh, and I, tied up in that is a little bit of a Bitcoin speculative price set call for you. So apologies for that. Uh, so so my, my view on this is that um you know there is still some degree of um sort of de-risking and liquidation and sort of sorting out like amongst the wreckage of of what happened in the last few months with with terra and other things kind of where um you know where the chips lie in some sense like where you know who who is kind of hurt coming out of this who is going to kind of like shut down business you know potentially and who's, who's perfectly fine. I think the vast majority of people are perfectly fine. Like, you know, I think the, the contagion effects were relatively well contained. Um, so I do think we, we chop around, um, you know, mostly because I think just risk assets in general are kind of in this, um, this spot where we have to kind of build enough risk appetite back in the market before things sort of trend back higher. Um, and so, yeah, I think in the short term, it's gonna be choppy. Um, another thing that's sort of like weighing on Bitcoin prices is the fact that there is a lot of supply of these call options um, that have, are sitting with dealers like like Genesis and others. Um, and that that means that, you know, on every rally of Bitcoin, when we're sort of rehedging our derivatives book that has a lot of these call options, we're sellers of, of Bitcoin. Um, and it's not just us. It's like a bunch of people in the market have kind of similar positioning. So um, and that's maybe short term, right? That's maybe like a week to a month, but there's a lot of supply of that. So that, that will keep things range bound a bit. Um, I think like longer term looking further out, um, you know, like I said, Bitcoin has this sort of natural narrative um, and it's, you know, a very strong one. Like I think people understand the thesis now, like if you, if you go back through to the last cycle, um, you know, the, the 17, 18 cycle, um, there wasn't really 100% certainty in people's minds that Bitcoin and crypto generally as an asset class would exist forever, right? Um, I think what, what we've done in this cycle is we've really chopped off like that left tail. So basically we've eliminated the possibility that Bitcoin doesn't exist as a, as a sort of like idea, as a concept in the future. And people understand it's gonna exist. Um, if for no other reason that then it has, you know, 
an ETF that trades it, you know, CME futures that that um, are linked to it. And, you know, every hedge fund and venture firm in the world has some exposure to it. Right. It's just very hard to kind of eliminate that. And so, um, you know, we're at the point now where it, it has to exist, like people need it, um, which means that it's going to trade the same way that a lot of other risk assets that people need. Uh, it'll just follow them. So it'll follow equities, it'll follow commodities, you know, gold to some extent. Um, it'll just be a piece of people's portfolios forever. And so in the long run, like obviously it'll it'll um, probably rebound and come back and, and trade at a fair level where people kind of want to have to, you know, want to uphold it in their portfolios. Um, and, uh, and, you know, I think it'll, like I said earlier, it'll trickle down from Bitcoin to kind of the rest of the, the asset class, whether it's ETH or other layer ones or, um, you know, application layer tokens, things like that. Yeah. Awesome. And that was great information on the range bound price of Bitcoin right now because of the derivatives trap it's, it's involved with right now. That's great information. Josh, thank you so much for joining us on the Compass podcast. Really appreciate your insights into the liquid market right now. Uh, definitely something our audience needs to listen to. And uh, again, thank you for your time. Where can people find you? Is Twitter the best place or anywhere else? Yeah, I'm, I'm on Twitter as um, Joshua underscore J underscore Lynn. Awesome. Okay. Thanks again for your time and talk to you soon. All right. Thank you. Thanks for having me.